Mastering engineers, we're not magicians, alchemists, or brain surgeons. And why are so many of us elusive with what we're doing here behind the desk? The reality is, with more music being made day in day out, or at least for myself, I'm in more demand than ever. And that demand comes from a segment of the market who are creative professionals that have vested in the fiscal interests of their projects and doing as best as they can out in the marketplace. So they've got the funds to take care of people like me. However, there are projects which, for financial reasons, timeline, logistics, or otherwise, don't call on having a dedicated mastering engineer like myself. But what are their alternatives? Someone off Fiverr? Automated mastering? Your third Tinder match from Saturday night? What about doing it yourself? And I'm sure you've tried and it's confusing, I get it. In a DAW, there are so many tools at our disposal, it's hard to pinpoint where and how to start. Well, that's what this video is for. I'm gonna lay out a four step system for consistent DIY mastering. I'm not promising you that you're gonna achieve the same level of expertise, fluency, or results of a dedicated mastering engineer. However, this framework will give you a step up to consistently deliver the best results you can within your own given skill set. And to put my money where my mouth is, as I go through these steps, I'm going to showcase the process of mastering this mix from the Colby's only using freely available plugins in my DAW. Now, before we jump into it, if you're interested in developing on your skill sets further, I've created an in-depth course, Mastering for Producers, that details everything you need to know to craft the best sounding EDM masters across seven and a half hours of content. I'll leave a description for that in the link below. And now let's actually jump into what you're here for. The first step is prepare. And what do you mean by prepare? Most YouTubers will just throw some plugins on the mix bus and call it a day. However, what happens when you need to recall a master at someone's request, or if you need to make a change to the mix? The possible iterations of a session file grows by the power of two at each potential intersection. When it comes to mastering, your data is gold, so trust me, in preparation, you prepare to succeed. And I've been in the position where things have been left to field and I've had a headache trying to follow breadcrumbs to produce the correct assets for my clients because I didn't prepare correctly. I didn't prepare correctly. No, I didn't prepare correctly. So to begin preparing, we're gonna follow a simple rule. Export a mix you're happy with. And by happy, I mean you and all relevant parties have signed off on. And you're gonna take that mix and work on it in a separate session. This mix here by the Colby's was signed off by the artist, signed off by the mixing engineer and myself ahead of going into the mastering session. Now, how do you export your mix? Well, you should be exporting that mix at the native sample rate and bit depth of the original session. Um, and also that includes any processing that it was on that mix when people signed off on it. So that includes mix bus processing, yes, leave it on. A lot of people are going to say, no, you're meant to take it off. But no, if people have signed off on the creative, leave it on unless it's really going to cause issues in mastering. Now, given that the mix is exported, we're going to set up the session in our DAW. To do so, we're going to need four stereo audio channels. So we'll pull this up, wrong, wrong shortcut there. And we're going to add four here. So we're going to add three audio channels and one master bus channel. Now, between these four channels, the first one is gonna be our read channel. And that is where we'll read and process the mixer's signal by basically adding our processing inserts there. The second one is gonna be our write channel. The third one will be our compare channel. And the last one, I don't know why I made that an audio file, that's actually incorrect. Um, is meant to be a master bus channel for all of our monitoring. So let me just pull that up. I don't know why I made that mistake. That's a rookie error, rookie error. This read channel needs to go to the output. So we're going to make that output to, we're going to call this output printer. That's going to output to our write channel. And we'll make that input printer there. And the reason for that is we want to capture our masters in real time. Well, here's a workflow hack, and there's going to be a couple throughout this video. By doing so, I can actually punch in edits at any stage of the the music. I can compare alternate versions as well by creating a playlist of the masters I'm committing. And I'll be able to also automate things here on the fly in real time if I so see fit. So it's just a good workflow thing to have a read channel which pictures and a write channel which captures. Now the, this third compare channel down here is where I'll sit the original mix on and I'll also create a playlist of any other references the client's given me um, in order to A and B between my processed signal up here and my original signal down here. Finally the master channel, well this is basically where we will just add Voxengo Westpan, there we are. This is basically where we can just add our metering tools 
to monitor our output signal. Um, I've got Voxengo Span here because I said I'd only be using free plugins, but typically I'll be using something like Isotope Insight, um, which I've got here. And this is typically my main tool of choice when it comes to doing this. Now, given that is our session set up, let's get into our next stage of preparing, which is gain staging. For importing your mix, it's important to do a waveform analysis. So waveform analysis in a program like Isotope Audio Editor, I tried to find a free alternative for the sake of this video because I thought it'd be great. However, I couldn't find one. So if you know one that can do what I'm going to show you right now, let me know in the comments below. But basically you drag your mix into here, you find the waveform statistics, and not only will it give you the true peak value, it'll also provide you a time marker, 2 minutes and 43 seconds, where that loudest true peak actually is. And this is important because this is how we're going to set up our gain staging. We know at negative 0.5 dB true peak, uh, I don't know why that's an equal, there is, that, that is the loudest point of this track by just pure signal, okay, by pure signal. So 243, we're going to go into here, get a marker at 243. This should be in grid mode. I don't know why it's like that. Let's just go 243, add a marker there true peak. Now this loudest true peak is where you're going to set your initial gain stage from and reference throughout whenever you're calibrating the outputs or inputs of your processes and what we're going to do is we're going to start this off by being negative six decibels true peak. Okay so it's negative 0.5 so if we bring this overall down 5.5 dB, we know that's going to be a 6 decibel true peak. But why gain stage? Well, here's another workflow hack, and this one comes from experience. When you gain stage the output of each processor to match the level of the original input, you can then switch the order of those processes and inserts, or even bypass, bypass individual processes without changing the line level of the signal going through the inserts. Simply put, it prevents you from fucking things up when you change things around. And for workflow's sake, this single tip should have you smashing the like button and subscribing to this channel. Seriously, trust me, once you do this alone, it will open up doors for you. With the session set up, the initial gain stage set to negative six decibels true peak at its loudest point, the final part of preparing for your master is the first pass. And the first pass, that's simple. You listen to the track from start to end. You're not gonna reach for any tools right now other than a pen, a paper, a notepad on your laptop and make notes under two categories. The first one is gonna be what is pushing you away with this material? And the second one is what's pulling you in, what's engaging you as a listener. By answering these first two questions in the first pass, you're gonna have a compass to base your decision making on when you start processing your actual master. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the next three minutes taking notes. We're gonna listen start to end. I'm gonna take my notes about what pushes me away and what pulls me in, and you can do the same. Then we're gonna actually get to start processing this. And when we do, I'm really curious to see what notes you had that might have been the same or different to me. So if you're hearing anything that I'm hearing that I write down on the screen, let me know in the comments section below. And if you hear something different that I might have missed, same deal. Leave a comment in the section below and say, well, I heard X, Y, Z. And it'll be interesting to see where we will sort of compare there. When I'm alone, the noise is screeching. The sound of loneliness is creeping. Since you left, I've been in a sorrowful state Turn Netflix on and listen To pluck out your gentle whisper I tell our friends that I'm fine, but I ain't okay And I want you back in my bed tonight To try
That was bloody nice. There wasn't an awful lot pushing me away other than the fact that I just wanted more low end. The overall mix was super solid. More low end would have done it for me. The stereo feel was good. The guitar sounded great. Everything was controlled in the high end. Some of the air got a little bit too shiny at times when the cymbals were going and the guitars were really screaming at the end there. Um, but otherwise, one thing I want more of, I want more low end because it feels a little bit empty down there. But what pulled me in, the rhythm guitar had great energy, the guitar picking in the stereo field was nice, the stereo field was actually just beautiful throughout it, so there's very little for me to do. Um, add more low end and maybe control the dynamics just to get, add a little bit more weight to everything and also control some of those snare hits. So now let's get on to this second step, processing for greatness. And there are so many mastering techniques, different styles, mix qualities and sonic palettes to explore in mastering. There's a pretty hard reality though, many people need to swallow and that's 90% of what you'll be able to reasonably accomplish in mastering will be done through the manipulation of only two sonic qualities, the dynamics and the tone. Okay, so the safest bet is to start when you're processing with dynamics as any tonal changes you make or choose to tweak will always affect the way dynamics processes react if you place the tonal tweaks in the change first. So let's start with dynamics and dynamics can be sorted into two categories, macro dynamics and micro dynamics. Macro dynamics are the differences in volume between various passages in a piece of music and micro dynamics are the differences in volume between various notes in a piece of music. Now first we're going to approach the macro dynamics and something I like to do is everything tempo aligned to a grid I can chop up the various passages or sections of the song Now, by doing this, this allows us to take into consideration from one passage to the next. Did the amount of volume going from the verse into the chorus, was it complementary? Was it jarring? Did it lose or gain energy where it should or shouldn't? And by having this cut up to the grid, we can simply just clip gain up and down on these stop points, half a dB to a decibel, just to help us create a little bit more energy from one phrase to the next. And the reason why I like to do this pre-processing is because doing this afterwards, you've already done all your compression, you've already done all your limiting, and all you're doing is taking a squash signal and moving it up and down. Whereas doing it here um, before we actually jump into processing means that it will feed into our dynamics process. It will feed in to any way we're feeding, where we're actually manipulating the signal. So this is really important in terms of the big picture of how people hear this record. Now that's all cut up, let's consider microdynamics. Now, what I want you to do is look at your notes. We spent time on this first pass writing down things that helped us, things that didn't. Now, we're going to take care into careful consideration here. Where are my notes? There they are. Take into careful consideration how I can either embellish some of these qualities which pull me in or remedy anything that pushed me away. And I want you guys to remember, just because we wrote these notes, just because we can use a compressor, doesn't mean you need to do anything. Sometimes things just sound good as they are. So let's consider some of these notes here. So let's look, what pushed me away? The snare drum is super dynamic and popping out, or is it just the general glue of the track? That's a question I was asking myself. And some additional compression to give weight or attitude, because I felt there was a bit of distance between where the instrument bed was, the percussion and the vocals. So there's something there where the guitar can serve to help certain elements, which are just pushing me away a little bit as a listener. What's pulling me in? Well, I don't, the guitar's good. The guitar picking the stereo field's good. I, there's not an awful lot compression can do here to help those elements, so sometimes better just to stay away. Um, however, that snare drum was really snappy, really poppy. I think if we use um, some soft compression, just a little bit, just to help gel it together, we can get something that will work really nice. Now, the tool I'm going to recommend for this, I recommend in 90% of my videos, is TDR Katalnikov, because it's just an incredible tool. Um, now we've got our six decibel true peak here for our gain staging. So we'll get back to that later. However, let's go to this, um, this loud section here. Let's listen through and dial in some compression, which I feel will help tame a bit of that snare and gel the overall mix.
just want to AB that snare, make sure it's just cutting it down enough. Okay, so we've got a gain stage here because it's it's taking quite a bit of the volume out. So let's look at our peak level here. So what you might notice there is I'm looking at the true peak level here on my peak level meter and then compensating the amount of makeup gain. So at that highest true peak, I'm still consistently going into the plugin at negative six decibel true peak and leaving it at negative six decibel true peak right there at that loudest true peak level we mark it out at the start. Now we can correctly AB it because I've got a better, a better marker for, to actually listen to those changes because everything's matched going in and out. I think that's the wrong section to be listening to because the snares are a bit masked by all the guitars. So let's go back into the verses. Yeah, so I don't mind it doing a lot of compression in the chorus to give it that gel, but I think I need to be a little bit more aggressive on the threshold here during the verses. Okay, and we'll do that same thing where we get this true peak value here. Okay, so that's now peak matched on the output. Yeah, I actually like that. It's clamping down on the snare flavorsomely. I don't know if that's the right word. It's it's just it's just tasteful. It's 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 clamping down on it enough that it's not completely killing it, but it's just holding it in a pocket. Now let's listen to how that compression works in those louder sections. reasonable actually the guitars are slightly pulling in a little bit further to the listener but it's not warping their tone because remember i said something that i liked here i love their tone they sound great so not too concerned with that next following dynamics is tone and tonal balance in a master is critical because we've got a few things to weigh up here you need to consider how something balances on a technical level so it can translate well when it leaves your space but also you need to be conscious of the musical qualities. And again, a lot of what has been done in preparation for this stage is critical. So consulting my notes, I know something musically which has to happen. And that is, I want more fatness from the low end to support the energy of the guitars. That That is a good guiding note. It's pretty clear what I need to do is boost some frequency in the low end. Um, but also I have to be conscious of how much I boost. Because if I boost too much, when this leaves this room, it's going to sound really odd, really weird. People are going to be like, oh, that's a lot of low end. So to do this, we're going to use basic EQ and we're going to use the default EQ. EQ, where are we? EQ seven band. This is the default stock Pro Tools one because I can and I will. Um, and we want to boost that low end. So let's, and it's really mainly this, these larger sections where the guitars are screaming that I feel like the low end needs to be there to, you know, support it a bit. So let's do that now. Now, we have to remember with EQ, this isn't a lesson about EQ, but everything is relative. And 
what we do the low end affects the top end, and what we do the top end affects the low end. Now, I don't want to boost more than two decibels here, but I feel like there's still a little bit too much focus on the top end, and I think it's those those, those symbols, those that that movement and air in the top end. So I might actually put a, low, a high shelf here, but take off 1.5 decibels, let's say from about 10, 1, 2, 3, upwards. Whoops, what was that? What did I do there? No, that's cool. All right, that's good. Actually, I might just bring that down. Let's have a listen to this. Alright, and we'll level match this on the peak level as well, because that's really important. Okay, so we've got a peak match, so our gain staging is done there. Let's actually have a listen to this EQ now. Okay, I actually really like that. Let's just spot check these sections here. Since you left, I've been in a sorrowful state. Turn Netflix on and listen to block out your gentle whisper. I tell our friends that. That just sounds fucking good. That sounds really good. Um, and remember, we also have this compare channel down here. So when we're processing, we can make A, B between the before and after. We've both got the same peak, loudest true peak level here. So let's actually have a listen to before and after. I really like that. It's a warmer tone, definitely. So we lose a little bit of that diction and texture in the top end, but um, no, very good, very good. So now we're happy with the way it's being processed in terms of dynamics and tone, because I said that's 80% of what we do in mastering, but let's be honest, the only reason you've made it this far through the video is because your masters sound piss weak and you're trying to find an answer for that. And you're hoping to fill a gap in your process and that's okay. This next two-step process will help maximize your loudness without compromising on quality and not necessarily having to reach for so many different tools and processes. The first step is simple, control. And the second step is just as simple, and that is drive. So, step one, control. Again, I think I've failed you guys on the, where are we? Yep, I failed you guys on finding a clipper that was free, but I know they're out there. I just didn't have time to install one before making this video because I've been jumping from session to session and then I had lunch and then I've got to do this video. So anyway, I'm using standard clip. I know it's not free, but it's just a generic clipper. You just need a generic clipper. And what our aim is here is we're going to shave off stray peaks, overly loud snaps, and little bits of microdynamic information that is otherwise chewing up our headroom, okay? And the aim of this is that if we can control these peaks, bring our headroom down, we can basically feed our limiter a little bit hotter, a little bit harder, get a little bit more loudness out of it. And anything around negative one to negative two dB of clipping is ample to buy yourself enough headroom to make a good loud master. Now, the good thing is we already know where our loudest peak is. We know where things are going to get hot on our clipper and that is at our true peak value. That is the loudest peak. So we know here it's already negative six decibels. So if we clip here, if we clip, if we want to clip two decibels here, okay, this is where we get funny, bit of maths involved. We gain up six decibels. We now are at the ceiling. We clip down two decibels, which puts us, should be at 2 dB true peak, and then we can gain down four decibels. Okay, it's a little bit of maths there, but this is this this is why gain staging is important. So this should give us a result of negative six decibels true peak. Let's go over here and have a look. Okay, with the exception of 0.2 decibels of tolerance, I think that's relatively good. So let's actually bypass this clipper and have a listen to before and after. Voice, 
And you can see we're not clipping a whole lot. It's only these little red peaks here on this meter that is actually showing us what we're clipping. Have a look at this. And if we go before and after on the compare channel, this is going to be night and day. And mind you, they're both the same true peak level at its loudest point. So anyway, that's the first pro part of the process, which is to control. And the second part is to drive. So I'm going to actually use a generic limiter here that they have to, where are we? Oh my God, I can't, oh, that is so bad. All these NDAs, why are there so many NDAs there? So now we've got our standard limiter. We're gonna set the ceiling to negative 0.2 decibels. Sorry for that, I just can't show you those plugins on there because uh, I'm a beta tester and they're not actually released. They, they're not in existence yet with, with the world. So I'll get in a bit of trouble if you guys saw what's on that list. Um, so yeah. Let's do this. All right, so now it's time to set up the limiter. Um, our ceiling will be negative 0.2. The threshold, we know if we're at negative six decibels here, we shouldn't actually technically be getting any limiting happening. Let's just double check because our peak should just be negative 0.2 and that should just gain up six decibels. Okay, that's good. Now all that's left to do is let's do maybe one and a half dB of limiting. So that'll be negative seven and a half dB on the threshold. And now look at this overall short term loudness. We're actually hitting some decent good volume without having to over compress all the material. Oops, what's going on there? I've done something. All right, now let's do it. It is as simple as that. Just simply taking down some notes, considering the dynamics, considering the EQ, considering how we can control and then drive the signal, um, we can get to a really good stage between the processing and the maximizing our overall gains. Now, the final step in this process is to commit to export. So basically to do this, we highlight our region, hit record, and record this start to end. So I'm going to do that, but I'm going to time lapse this because you don't actually need to listen to it all get recorded, what's important is the output. So let's do that. Now you're probably asking, why do I capture this all in real time? Well, I want to audition every zero, single zero and one binary code, every little sample that's being committed to the final file. And when you're doing this final pass, you're also ensuring that you're 100% with everything before it leaves into the real world. From here, what's left to do really? Well, we can top and tail the start. So that would mean we'll put in shuffle mode. We'll cut this start just a little bit tighter. One moment. A little fade there, let's audition that. That's good. And then at the end, just make sure the fade out is reasonable. Yep, that's good. We'll commit them. And from here, we can export it at the native bit depth and sample rate of this session, which is 2448. I'll throw that up onto the desktop. And what's left to do here? Well, one thing I think is pretty important is um, our ability to just drag that in, have multiple versions. So dragging it into the batch editor, then you can export a 44116 and for CD, a 320 kilobit second for your press kits. And there you have it, prepare. Process for greatness, maximize your gains and export your master. A four step process that's detailed for you to use when you're stuck with the task of having to do it yourself. And I hope this helped you along because this was fun to put together. It's it's quite a simple process if you're doing it yourself. And if you're interested in watching more mastering related content, no, I'm not going to sell you on my course again. Um, just check out the YouTube channel. I've got lots of stuff from basic things like this on just how to do it yourself to very much more advanced topics like advanced time domain calculations and doing full walkthroughs and null tests of various tools I use in the studio. Um, so with that, I hope you enjoyed this. And until next time, take care. Thank <sighs> you.